Welcome to Built to Go, a van life podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wagg, coming to you from the College of Curiosity. This time it's episode 134, and we're going to talk about tire troubles and how to avoid them and what to expect when the unexpected happens, and some of the stuff is really unexpected. Stay tuned. We're also going to talk about using household switches in your 12-volt build, a tale from the road involving a broken dream, and a product review of K&N filters. Do they really help your performance? Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for being here. Hey, I've got a couple of just quick things to toss in here, so I don't know where to put them, so I'm going to put them here, okay? One thing is, if you have an Apple Watch or some other kind of watch with a magnetic band, like mine is this leather band that wraps around my arm. I don't have to clasp anything. It's kind of handy, but you definitely do not want to wear that when you're working on any kind of cutting metal in your van. And I can tell you why very easily. I installed a step on my van. I talked about it last week, I think. And when you drill through the van, you actually have to drill through the seam that's underneath the rocker panels. You create a lot of little metal shavings. And now you see where I'm going with this. Yes, after I was done doing this, all those metal shavings had stuck to my watch band and gotten underneath my watch band and gave me the most unusual rusty rash that I've had in a while, and I couldn't wear my watch for a few days. So something to be mindful of, those little metal shavings are a problem in many ways, and now we have a new one, thanks to technology, that your watch can actually attract the metal shavings and give you trouble. So, word to the wise, either get a watch that is suitable for wearing while you're doing construction, just some kind of simple watch that's tough and isn't magnetic, (laughs) or just take your watch off, which is probably the best idea. I know you want to count those steps while you're running around your van, but uh, yeah, not with that band. The other thing is that My friend Patrick from Montreal, who is a firefighter and is generally aware of good safety tips, pointed out that it is a scary time for USB cables. You remember I talked about USB a few episodes ago. Well, there are cables out there that look just like a regular cable. You look at the cable and it's a cable. You don't think anything of it. But in the plugs on either end now, there can be circuitry and logic and keystroke recorders, and even wireless transmitters, such that if you use one of these cables, you can actually transmit everything you type to somebody else who wants to observe you. And these cables aren't even expensive. I've seen them online for as little as $75. Now, if you're using only cables you own that you bought for significantly less than that, you are likely quite safe. But be warned. Unknown cables, cables that you don't know where they came from, and USB outlets can be a danger. It is not hard to create a charging outlet in the wall and actually have that be live and active and actually doing things. So just a word to the wise, the safest thing to do is to buy OEM cables, which, you know, that has its own issues, or at least buy cables from a known good source and Carry a battery with you and charge that way rather than using random charging points around the globe. I used to criticize folks for carrying a 110 volt USB charger with them because there's so many 5 volt USB chargers all around the world, but actually that's a way to keep yourself safe because if you know where that 110 volt charger came from, it provides a shield between any data catchers and your devices. So just two quick tips that didn't fit anywhere else. And well, now they've taken up three whole minutes of this podcast. But uh, yeah, it's worth it because they're important. Now, you may notice my voice is a little bit huskier this week. It's because I just came back from a training. I, I spent all weekend training some folks on uh, how to tear down houses and stuff like that because that's what I do. So I apologize if my voice is a little different, but it isn't going to stop me. We're just going to roll right on with it. And uh, yeah, so tires, right? Why, why did I create an entire opening segment about tires? That sounds like a little tech talk thing, right? No, no, tires is a big deal. 
If you think about it, your vehicle is only touching the road on these tiny little four points or six points, depending on your van, where the tire touches the road. The entire rest of your van is in the air being suspended by these little points of rubber. So tires are super important. But I'm not going to talk about tread wear and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to talk about something a lot more practical, which is how do you get new tires? Now, you bought a brand new van, you've got brand new tires, everything's good, yay, you're riding all over the country and you're going off-road and having a great time, and then after 20, 30, 40,000 miles, depending, your tires are kind of (laughs) smaller. You've worn away all that rubber that was protecting you and you need new tires. So, how do you get them? There's the old tried and true method of you go to the tire store and say, excuse me, I would like to get some new tires for my vehicle. And that works. That is absolutely a good way to do it. But it has some problems. We still have supply chain issues. And sometimes the tire stores will be happy to sell you tires, but they can't get them just yet. And you have to wait for them. Other times they are restricted in what they can sell. Maybe they can only sell Goodyear brand and you want to try a Toyo or something like that. So a lot of people now buy tires online. I do. I think the last four times I've bought tires, it was online and I just bought new tires for my M3 ambulance that is slowly turning into a camper van. So I decided to buy some little bit more aggressive tires. Now, That doesn't really make sense for my usage. I'm spending most of my time on pavement. I should probably get a tire that's optimized for pavement, and that would be low roll resistance and quiet and long tread life and that kind of a thing. But I do find myself in places that are just a little bit off of that norm that I wanted to try a little bit more of an aggressive tread. I did not want to go full AT. I decided to kind of do a hybrid tire. And I've always been a fan of Nokian tires. Nokian is uh, used to be the same company that made Nokia cell phones. Remember how tough they were? Well, their tires are pretty much just as tough. It's a Finnish company that is there from Finland, and they have specialized in snow tires for years and years and years. The Nokian Hakapalita is one of the world-renowned off-road slash snow tires. I mean, they their rubber is different. It, it's softer, and it really, really grips into things, even ice. But they have a new line of tires now called the Nokian Outpost. And it's like this hybrid tire that somehow has aggressive tread and is also very quiet. Now, I haven't actually been able to try mine out yet. (laughs) They're on the van, but I haven't gone highway speeds yet, so I can't give you a review of them. But the process of getting them on the van was uh, educational and not necessarily in a fun way. So here's what happened. I ordered the tires on Simple Tire, which is a a site that I can recommend. They, They have good customer service and great prices. And their website's a little funky, but eh, whatever. I used their installer service. In Chicago, the only place I've ever used to work on my van is the dealership, and I'm trying to avoid that as much as possible. I have not formed a good relationship with a local mechanic, and that's bad. I really should try to do that, but I haven't. So I was like, yeah, okay. For 99 bucks, 25 bucks a tire, I can get these tires installed, and a nice convenient thing, Simple Tire will ship the tires directly to the installer, so I don't have to carry these heavy things around and put them in my van or anything like that. It all sounds great, and I've done this before, and it works. It's not a problem, except when it is. Now, I live in Chicago. Chicago is a tight place. I mean, I I live in the city. People say they live in Chicago and they actually live like in Gary, Indiana or something. No, I live in Chicago in the city. And when I got to the mechanic shop that was going to install the tires, they took one look at my van and laughed because they couldn't put tires on it because they are restricted by some policy that they can only put tires on a vehicle using a lift. And my van is over nine feet tall and they didn't have enough space in their garage to use the lift. Now, there is no way to predict this on Simple Tire. I mean, you would basically have to order the tires on Simple Tire and then go down the list of installers and call each one and see if they can actually handle your vehicle, which is actually what I recommend you do. But I thought that, you know, maybe they would have vetted this somehow. No, they don't vet this at all. 
all the installers on Simple Tire and probably on other tire sites are just meant for regular old cars. They don't consider that you've got this big van. So they said, no, they can't do it. And I called Simple Tire and said, hey, they said, no, they can't do it. And Simple Tire called around and found another shop, explained the size of my van, and that other shop said, sure, bring it over. And so I went over there, and they took one look at my van and laughed. And like, you know, what the heck, we prearranged this. And they said, well, technically we could do it, but now that we see the size of the van, it's going to block off our entire shop. And, well, we just can't have that. But why don't you go to our sister shop on the other side of town? And at this point, I'm, I'm getting a little annoyed, and I said, all right, fine. So I go to this other shop on the other side of town, and they're not as busy, and they say, sure, we can do it. Now, I looked in the shop, and they looked like there was physically enough distance uh, from the ceiling to the top of my van that they could lift it up on the lift. And I thought, okay, these guys are professionals. I don't have to tell them things like, you know, there are certain places you're supposed to put the lift, etc., and to be very careful jacking it up so you don't hit the ceiling. And... Uh, I know from installing solar panels on my roof that that has happened before. I actually have a crease across my ceiling where someone has hit the roof with the van. And I could barely see out the window a corner of them working on my van, and they didn't even use the lift. They used floor jacks. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, that solves that problem. So, you know, you can change wheels using a floor jack. That's not the end of the world. It takes a little bit longer. So, okay, that's an option. Fine. Great. So after about 25 minutes, they say, okay, your van's done, and they back it out. And I look, and the tires are on, and the old tires are disposed of, and I'm like, great, this is wonderful. And they put on wheel weights, which is a sign that they actually did balance the wheels. Now, they used external hammer-on wheel weights on my nice alloy rims. I'm not thrilled with that, but whatever. It's a van. I'm not trying to win any beauty contests here. Well... I get home and I park the van and I had stuff to do, so I didn't look at the van for a few days. And then I come out and I notice that brand new step I installed is now flat against the bottom of the van. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't put the jack in the right place. So uh, know this, folks, especially if you have a Sprinter. These big vans are not jacked up the same way as cars. On cars, you generally put the jack along the rocker panels, sometimes on either side of the seam. That's where the rocker panels are. The rocker panel is the lowest piece of metal between the wheels, basically. It's the bottom edge of the van. That's not where you jack up a large van. You want to jack up a large van from the rails, which are deeper in. That's not what they did. And they lifted up the entire eight, nine, ten thousand pounds of my van on this very, fairly weak piece of metal and crushed it. And that crushing it bent up my step. They didn't actually bend the step itself, but they bent the metal under it. They didn't tell me this, and I didn't notice it until several days after I left. Now, could I go back and complain? Yeah. Am I going to? No, because I can see that I can fix this myself, and I'm just going to do that. It's easier. It's less hassle. So... Word to the wise, if you buy tires online, make sure you have a shop that can install them and knows how to install them on your van. Every van's going to be a little bit different, but they are not cars. They are not done the same way. Now, if you have a minivan or an NV200 or a smaller van like that, you're probably fine. I'm talking about bigger vans, Sprinters, Transits, E350s. And if you have Dooleys, well, then you're in for a whole other world of hurt because some dualies require a special adapter to remove them and not all these shops are going to have them. The other part to know is, even though I had worked it out with Simple Tire that they were going to pay for my install and they actually gave me a discount for the troubles and that, that was all great, the starting price for changing tires on my van at the shop that finally did it was $150. That was to start. And then they had to charge me $6 for a rebuild TPMS kit and all this other stuff. It ended up being about $161. I paid $75 because that was my deal with Simple Tire. So I actually made out money-wise in the end, but it cost me running around town, and I now have a crush step that I have to fix. So think about those things when you're trying to get a tire installed. The easiest, safest thing to do is to find a dealer. And if you live out west that, you know, you have off-road outfitters and stuff like that, that's not going to be a problem. But if you're in the city where vans like mine are only for fleets, you know, people just don't drive these around as their daily vehicle, it's a lot harder. 
But I do hope to have a review of my Nokian Outpost tires soon. And right now I'm really excited about them because they kind of have all this like rough looking, you know, and yeah, right, I'm being silly. But that's okay. I'm allowed to be silly because in the end of the day, this is all for fun, right? It is, isn't it? Tech Doc. Household switches. So, you know, your house is full of switches. So you've got wall switches that turn things on and your van needs some switches. And many of you, and I have done this, I admit it, not recently, but in the past, have just gone to the hardware store and said, well, that's a switch. Why can't I use that on my 12 volt system in my van? I mean, I've got 110, 120 volts AC in my house. I've got 12 volts DC in my van. But ultimately, all a switch is, is two pieces of metal that touch each other and complete a connection. What difference does it make if it's 12 volts or 120 volts? I mean, actually, if you look at the switch, it will give you a range of voltages, and it's often like 600 volts or something crazy like that. So, yeah, it should work. And you will find that if you do go to Home Depot, wherever, buy a household switch and use it in your van, it's going to work just fine. Now, exceptions for dimmer switches, some of those are going to give you a hard time because they actually use the voltage or something. Or if your switch lights up, that's another thing. But a normal switch, absolutely. But why is there a difference then? Why are automotive 12 volt switches different than household switches? I mean, why do they exist? And it turns out there is a reason, and it's something you may not notice unless it's a switch that's used a lot. Over time, household switches may fail in a 12 volt application because of what happens when those two pieces of metal hit each other. Now, in a household application, you're using 110 to 120 volts and at a fairly low amperage. I mean, the most you're probably going to draw on a normal household switch, a normal household switch is 15 amps. In a van, 15 amps isn't very much because as you will remember, there is an inverse relationship between voltage and amps. Higher volts, lower amps. Lower volts, higher amps. In your van, you've got lower volts than your household, therefore you're drawing more amps. And the more amps you draw basically creates a bigger spark when you connect those two pieces of metal, and that creates scoring and pitting and problems like that. And over time, that can cause the switch to fail. So, the bottom line is, can you use household switches in your van for your 12 volt applications? The answer is yes. Is it the best thing to do? Maybe not, because over time they will tend to fail. However, there is a converse to this. Even though that's all true, household switches tend to be higher quality than the cheap switches you can get for 12 volt applications because they're regulated differently. So a high quality 12, uh, a high quality household 110 volt switch could actually last longer than a low quality purpose made 12 volt switch. So you have to weigh that too. At the end of the day, just know what you're getting into. If you really wanna use a household switch, if you have a perfect application for it, go ahead and do it. Just be aware that, you know, after a couple of years, you might wanna replace it. And, you know, that's okay. They don't cost a lot of money and they're fairly easy to replace. So now you know. Tales from the road. I hesitate to tell this story because it because not only is it painful, um, the person who this happened to may actually be a listener. So, Tom, if you're out there and you're listening to this, well... I, I hope this story doesn't bring back painful memories, <laughs> but uh, way back when I was living in Utah, uh, I had a group of friends. We all had Vespas. We all rode around on old Vespas, like 1979 Vespas, P125Xs, and Salt Lake City is an amazing place for scooters. I mean, the city is just designed for scooters. But over time, we started to get into a little bit more bigger things, and uh, a friend of mine really started to like Volkswagens. And he bought a Volkswagen Bug and drove that for a while, but then it all rusted out on the bottom, so he had to get rid of that. But then he decided to go all in and took all the money he had and bought a Volkswagen Sun Bus. I mean, the body in this thing was beautiful. This had all the potential in the world, and this was way back in the early 90s. These days, this would be something worth an incredible amount of money. But it, the engine was rotten. The engine was no good in this thing. And he thought, well... 
I'll just get a Chilton's manual and a new engine and parts, and we'll just rebuild it. And he literally, in his living room, rebuilt this engine part by part using good equipment, using good parts, and rebuilt this Volkswagen engine in his living room. Now, one of the nice things about Volkswagens is the engine's small enough that you can actually do this. If you tried to do this with a Sprinter engine, it would probably fall through the floor into the basement. But uh, Volkswagen's engines, you can just actually manhandle them, to use a dated term, out of the vehicle and put them back in, and that's just what he did. And so after spending all summer being an absolute perfectionist on this engine, getting all the right parts, he finally, finally got it installed in the van. And, he, you know, that there's that moment where you, you have to turn the key to finally hear you, what your creation has become. And he does this, and he turns the key, and it starts right up. He had done it. He had rebuilt an engine and put it in a vehicle. And that joy lasted for about 10 seconds because then it started to make noises, and then it stopped forever because in all his meticulous attention in all his research and putting in all the correct parts and this is before the internet he was doing this all from paper he had forgotten to put oil in it he started a new engine with no oil in it and it seized and died and he ended up selling the entire thing for parts and that was the end of Tom's van life, and it's kind of sad. Now, I understand now he has a trailer that he's fitting out, and that's all good, and I'm glad he kept on. But, man, that is one of the more heartbreaking <laughs> van stories that I have to tell. And uh, word to the wise, <laughs> yeah, put your oil in your, in your engine, because, um, I mean, yikes. Product review. K&N filters. So I have used K&N filters, um, not really by choice. I've just kind of inherited vehicles that had them. In fact, the reason I'm telling you this story is because if you pop the hood on my Sprinter van, there's a K&N sticker on the air cleaner. Generally, when you buy a K&N filter, it will come with a sticker that you put on the air cleaner so that you can tell people, hey, this is a high quality, high performance K&N filter and you should not replace it because K&N filters are cleanable. They're supposed to be permanent filters that you can clean and oil and they will give you better performance and protect your engine for the rest of the life of your vehicle. And I looked at my air filter and uh, no, it's a regular old paper filter. <laughs> Somebody had actually replaced the k &N filter at some point. So why? Did somebody screw up? I don't know. I don't know the history of the mechanic who did that. But I do know that of all automotive things, k &N filters is one of the most controversial. You can put it right up there with seafoam as just this thing that you can find all kinds of pros and cons for this thing. And well, I'm going to give you my perspective on it and you can make your own decision. So the idea between a K&N filter is that it's a highly engineered air filter that will let more air through than the filter that the dealer recommends, and that gives your engine more power and better gas mileage, and it just makes everything better. Okay, that sounds good. Why wouldn't you want that? I mean, instead of spending $10 for a replacement filter, why not spend $30, $40, or $50 for a permanent filter? And you'll get more power. I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. And... It's such a no-brainer that you have to wonder why the automotive manufacturer doesn't just do this in the first place. I mean, if you've invented something that makes vehicles better, why isn't it in the vehicle? And this is kind of the truism of all of these wonderful things like tuner chips and magnets that save your fuel lines and all this crap. I think K&N filters actually fall in the same thing. But wait, you say, there have been studies that show that K&N filters do let more air flow through and do let the engine perform better. And there doesn't seem to be any harm to the engine. So why not? Okay, well, yes, let's agree that K&N filters let more air through. But that's not the purpose of an air filter. An air filter's purpose is to block debris. So yes, in the short term, if you put in a K&N filter, you will see an increase in performance. But in the long term, 
that comes at the cost of the filter actually letting more crap into your engine. And that's what the air filter is supposed to do, to keep the crap out of your engine. And honestly, think about this. Automotive engineers must have considered this balance between letting air in and keeping crap out. And you would think that in all their experience, they would have come up with the perfect balance. And well, they have. They have. And that perfect balance is found in the filters that come with your vehicle. That's my take on it. And I know people will say that they've used K&N filters for years and never had a problem. And great. But there are also studies that show indeed that engines wear faster if you use a K&N filter. So that's it. I'm out. You guys do what you want. Those are my thoughts on K&N filters. To me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to invest money in that area. If you want to invest money on better fuel mileage, just take care of the recommended maintenance methodically. Make sure all that stuff is taken care of exactly as the owner manual states. Because honestly, folks, the owner's manual is coming from the information of the automotive engineers who have the most experience with this. There are some exceptions where we've learned things after a vehicle is 10 years old that they didn't anticipate. Yes, I get that. But I'm going to trust the automotive engineers over a company whose existence depends on you believing that they know more than the automotive engineers and have for decades. I, I just can't buy it. A place to visit. I have been neglecting New Jersey, I believe. I don't think I've recommended too much about New Jersey. And New Jersey is a wonderful state, and it's a great state for van life. New Jersey is one of these states with a national reputation that it doesn't deserve. I mean, you think of New Jersey, and you think of what? The Sopranos? Uh, maybe Jersey Shores? I mean, come on. Jersey's actually a large enough state that it has different things going on, and some of it is amazingly beautiful. That area around Atlantic City, I mean, okay, Atlantic City is Atlantic City, but around there is beautiful beaches and marshes, and it's just amazing. And there are, of course, really interesting little singular places to visit, and I'm going to recommend one right now, and it's called Northlands. That's with a Z at the end, Northlands. Now, if you were somebody who traversed the Northeast way back in the day, which would be you know, the 80s and 90s, for me, um, you may have come across a place called Roadside America, which is was in Pennsylvania. And yes, there's a website called Roadside America. It got its name from this location. Roadside America was this tourist trap that was built in the 50s. And basically you went in and it was a giant train layout. And the idea was that it would be a representation of all the different ways people live in the U.S. in one big model train set. And it was, by the time I started going there, it was interesting in its kitschiness more than the actual model train set. The train was fine. It was interesting enough. But they would have simulated nighttime and then Kate Smith would start booming over the loudspeakers singing God bless America. And then an American flag would be projected on the ceiling waving. And yeah, it was, it was pretty corny, <laughs> but it has died now. The, the owners died. And so has the place it's gone. You cannot have the roadside American experience, <laughs> but you can still have the Northlands experience. Northlands started off as a guy's model train set. And it got to be so good that he would charge admission to have people come see it. And then finally he moved it into a warehouse and well, it got to be so big that it takes hours to see it all. In fact, the entire train layout is over a mile long. And I don't mean there's a mile of track. I mean, you have to walk over a mile to see it all, <laughs> but that's not the interesting part. If you've ever been to house on the rock up in Wisconsin, where it's kind of an uh, otherworldly experience. It's like if a museum existed and also forced you to drop acid at the same time, and I'm not in a meow wolf kind of a way. Anyway, if you've been to these places, you, you kind of know where I mean. This is a train set on steroids. It is exaggerated in the vertical plane. You're basically looking at a madman's idea of what train America looks like. There are 
800 train tracks all intertwined going way up in the air i mean it's an entire warehouse filled with all these crazy train layouts and they're all somewhat based in reality and then they're not uh it's it's right on the edge of like okay i recognize this and yet it's really odd at the same time now the gentleman who created all this retired and just put the warehouse warehouse up for sale and left all the trains in it and a guy who actually sold himalayan salt bought the warehouse to store all his salt in but when he got there he saw the train layout and was so enamored with it that he gave up on the salt at that location and kept the trains going and he revamped them all and modernized all the electronics and well folks you can go see this thing today and it's one of these things that may not be around forever so i actually think you should see it it's in flemington new jersey it's only open friday saturday and sunday and it costs about 30 bucks so it's not like really inexpensive but they do have camping on site and they have an outside train and this is one of those classic old time american tourist trap experiences that we used to think were bad but now we kind of are nostalgic for and yeah i recommend you check it out i haven't yet it's on my bucket list and the next time i drive through new jersey i'm gonna get off the turnpike and go to flemington and visit northlands well, folks, my voice is failing me, so I'm going to end the episode here. Sorry, no resources this week. But thank you very much for listening to episode 134. If you need to get a hold of me, I am Jeff at builttogo.com. That's two T's, not three, not one. Music, as always, is by Simon Wagg. And until next time, remember the words of Jack Kerouac, who said, Our battered suitcases were piled on the sidewalk again. We had longer ways to go. But no matter, the road is life.